77. We have been looking for the last few weeks at the Psalms of Asaph. And this would fall into that category. Psalms 73 to 83 are the Psalms of Asaph. We see in the superscription here, it says, For the choir director, according to Jedithun of Asaph, a psalm. Jedithun was probably another musician uh, in the same way perhaps that Asaph was. Uh, That's probably what that superscription means there. We have seen somewhat of a common theme throughout these psalms of Asaph, and that is judgment on those who do wicked and do evil. That's kind of what we've seen is that Asaph and God's people, in whatever the situation and circumstance is at the time, they are going through hard times, and uh, Asaph is tempted to give up on God. God, have you forgotten us? God, look at what the evil are doing. They're getting away with everything. Perhaps it's better to do evil than to follow God. And even though perhaps those temptations came to his mind, and he almost slipped, he did not slip. He thought better of it. He came to his senses, and he realized, nope, It's better to trust the Lord, even if I don't always feel like he's there, even if it doesn't always seem as though he's working, God's people will be delivered and the wicked will be judged. Now that's kind of a brief summary of what we've seen through the last few Psalms of Asaph. And so we will pray and then we'll continue on tonight. God, we come to you and I thank you for these good words. And I pray, God, that you would help me to do a good job to preach and teach these words that you would hide me behind the cross tonight, dear Lord, take away my pride or or fear, that I may be able to do a good job for you and all for your glory, dear Lord. I pray, God, that your word would meet us where we are tonight. God, you know where we are, and God, chances are we probably know where we are. Maybe we are in a good spot in our walk with you, a good spot in life. Or maybe we are in a bad spot in our walk with you, tough spot in life. But God, wherever we are tonight, your word is good. And so I pray that you meet us where we are and let us be blessed by reading these words. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Amen. Psalm 77, verse 1. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. I sought the Lord in my day of trouble. My hands were continually lifted up all night long. I refuse to be comforted. I think of God. I groan. I meditate. My spirit becomes weak. Selah. Now, Selah there, we see it frequently in the Psalms. It is believed by many that it is a time of pause, perhaps a time of reflection of what was just stated. Now, whatever Asaph was going through, whatever trouble there was in his life, he was struggling. And what did Asaph do in his struggle? He cried out to the Lord. He lifted his voice, perhaps some of your translations say. The point being is he he verbally spoke. It wasn't a silent prayer. It wasn't something in his mind. He wasn't thinking on the Lord. He was literally physically speaking with his voice and calling out to the Lord. Now, perhaps we pray silently often, and and that's okay. We don't have to open our mouth to pray. But on the other hand, perhaps there are times that we need to open our mouth to the Lord, that we need to speak to the Lord, that we need to, in fact, cry out to the Lord. And for those who know the Lord and trust the Lord, as Asaph did, that is often the response that we have in our times of trouble. Perhaps as our times of trouble begin, we don't, cry out to the Lord. But perhaps as those times of trouble get harder and harder and harder, eventually the time will come for those who are God's children that there is nothing more to do than to cry out to the Lord. Maybe it is an enemy who is coming against us, something that's happening in our life beyond our control. Perhaps it's simply sin in our life. We feel the burden of our sin. We feel... Our joy has been taken from us because of our sin. Perhaps that is what drives us to our knees. Perhaps we need to be driven to our knees more often. 
Perhaps that's the desire of the Lord in some of our lives tonight, that we, like Asaph, would cry out to the Lord. And what assurance do we have when we cry out to the Lord that he will hear us? Now, we need to, we need to know that. We, we can see these words, and even if we know that is truth, sometimes we need to be reminded of that truth because sometimes, like Asaph in the Psalms before, we may be tempted to say, God, can you hear me? God, are you listening anymore? God, do you hear me when my enemies come against me? God, have you turned your ear from me because of my sin and lack of repentance? Because of my disobedience? We've talked about this over the last few weeks. What a, what a horrible thing it is to feel that you are no longer in the presence of the Lord. Especially when... You can see the sin and the choices and the neglect and the disobedience to God in your life. And when the moment comes that it feels as though God is no longer there, it's a scary moment. But we need to be reminded that God hears us when we call out. I sought the Lord in my day of trouble. I don't know what this day of trouble is, and it matters not because we have days of trouble. Sometimes they are days of trouble because of our own doing. Sometimes they are beyond our control. But whatever the case may be, we have days of trouble. My hands were continually lifted up all night long. Now, the translations may differ a little bit there, uh, but it seems as though the, the probably the most accurate reading there is, is what this translation and most would say. And that is, my hands were continually lifted up all night long, all night long, all night long. Now, we may be tempted in our times of trouble to say, God, help me, and we do not see God act in the way that we think he should, and we are done. We move on to something else. We seek, we seek comfort and joy in something else. But not so for Asaph, all night long. There are times in our life and our battles and our struggles against sin that we must humble ourselves and cry out before the Lord all night long. That we must lift our hands before the Lord, similar to what uh, Jacob did in the Old Testament when he wrestled with God and he said, God, I will not let you go until you bless me. Because that's what we desire in our times of trouble. And particularly in our times of sin, when we have sinned against God and we have lived in sin continually, what we want is the joy of God in our life. We want the blessing of God to return. We want the sorrow and the burden of sin to go away. And sometimes we must be in it for the long haul, all night long. Asaph said, I cried out to the Lord. I lifted my hands to the Lord. Maybe that is what some of us need tonight. Maybe we need to say, it is time for me to get serious about whatever it is that's going on in my life. I refuse to be comforted. That is, there is no comfort apart from God. Now, in our times of trouble, in our times of sin, we may try to think, well, maybe I'm not that bad. Maybe I'm pretty good. This is going good in my life. Maybe I can find comfort in this area, and maybe I can find comfort in that area. But in our deepest times of trouble, we cannot be comforted. We don't want to be comforted by anything else other than the Lord. God, I come to you. I call to you all night long. God, nothing else matters anymore except for you and your forgiveness and your blessing in my life. I think of God, I groan. That's what we do sometimes, right? Sometimes, as the scripture says, we don't know the words to say. In the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our sin, in the midst of our disobedience, we know God is not happy with the things we have done. We are not happy with the things that we have done. And sometimes we pray and we pray the same words and sometimes we don't know what else to say and we pray all night and we lay and we think and we meditate and we toss and we turn and we groan all night long with no comfort until it comes from the Lord because there is no comfort in no other. And all night long, Asaph cried out and he lifted his hands and he groaned to the Lord and his spirit became weak. You ever felt that way before? That's, that's quite a place to be. 
when we go before the Lord with all of our heart and we are weak because of our trouble and we are weak because of our sin and that is the best place for us to be. That is, I think, sometimes where God has to bring us. He has to bring us to our knees so he can lift us up. We have to recognize our weakness. We have to recognize our sin. We have to recognize our failure. We have to recognize that God is with us, but we must be with God. And in those times that we feel the weakest, that is the moment that God can begin to work. Because once we reach the bottom of the pit, there is only up. Once we reach our lowest point, there is nowhere else we can go but to the Lord. And that's where Asaph went. Verse 4. You've kept me from closing my eyes. I am troubled and cannot speak. I considered days of old, years long past. At night I remember my music. I meditate in my heart and my spirit ponders. Have you ever had a night like that before? Or in the midst of your troubles, perhaps things beyond your control, or perhaps because of the sin and the choices you have made, they go through your mind all night. You pray to the Lord, you seek the Lord, you cry out to the Lord, you weep, you groan, and sleep escapes you. You cannot find any sleep because there is no peace. There is no rest as we wrestle with the things around us because rest and peace only comes from the Lord. And so we desire greatly for that peace so that we can have that rest. But that rest is far from us until we are in good relationship with God. And that's what Asaph is saying here. I consider the days of old years long past. I wonder what he is considering about the days of old. Perhaps the days long past are the days in which he committed some sin that he is thinking about now. Perhaps the days of old were better days than the days there are now. We don't know what those days of old mean. Perhaps the days of old were bad things that are coming to his mind that God is dealing with him and working with him in this way right now. Perhaps he's saying the days of old were better than these days and I longed the days when I used to be in good fellowship with God and obedient to God and trouble was far from me, but that is not the case of Asaph now. And perhaps that's our desire sometimes in the days of trouble. We long for better days. But what made better days better days? Well, I think for many Christians, the answer to that is probably in the best days of our life, those are the days that we are walking the closest with the Lord. The worst days of our life are the days in which we are not walking closely with the Lord. Perhaps those are the days that he was longing for. At night I remember my music. I meditate in my heart and my spirit ponders. Perhaps his music or his song was a song of praise, a song of rejoicing, a song of a happier time. Perhaps that's what he seeks and he longs for on nights like the night that he is experiencing here. Verse 7. Will the Lord reject forever and never again show favor? Has his faithful love ceased forever? Is his promise at an end for all generations? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in his anger withheld his compassion Selah. What a scary thought. Perhaps some of us have pondered that thought. Perhaps we have been in that spot that Asaph was in. And we have asked these questions. Has God rejected me forever? Is God done with me? Have I rejected God? Have I turned on God? Have I chosen sin over God? Is God there? Does God listen? Does God love me? Is God's compassion good for me anymore? Is God gracious to me anymore? God, be gracious to me. God, be compassionate to me. God, all night long, I need you. I will wrestle with you. I will call out to you. I will cry out to you. God, do not leave me in this state. God, do not abandon me here. God, please do not reject me forever. What a scary place that is to be if that feeling should come into our life. And in those times, perhaps we pray harder than we have ever prayed in our life. 
God has a way of getting us to those places where we call out to him and trust him all the more. Perhaps that's what he was doing with Asaph. Perhaps that's what he's doing with you and I. Verse 10. So I say I am grieved that the right hand of the Most High has changed. Perhaps the idea that the hand changed is that the right hand of God is no longer with him. He doesn't feel that the right hand of God is protecting him, watching over him. That's what the believer desires. That's the promise of God, that God will watch over us and protect us with his mighty right hand. And that right hand that once watched over, protected Asaph, that hand has changed. Asaph says, I long for the days when I felt protected in the Lord. And now I long for the Lord, and so I call out to him, I am grieved. Verse 11, I will remember the Lord's works. Yes, I will remember your ancient wonders. I will reflect on all you have done and meditate on your actions. <clears throat> There's something about times like these that Asaph speaks of here. There's something about times like that in our life when we begin to reflect on our sin and disobedience and our trouble. And a lot of things come through our mind and perhaps we get to the point where we say, God, are you even there? God, please don't abandon me. And we get to the point where there is only one place that we can go and that is to the power of God. God, you are good. God, there is nothing I can say right now. God, forgive me. God, repent. God, I am sorry. But God, there's nothing I can offer up from my life. There is no good within me, and so we come to the only place we can come, and that is to the goodness of the presence of God and the power of God. And Asaph said, so I will remember you, God. I will remember who you are, God. And then he goes on to recall a story of years past. God, your way is holy. What God is great like God. You are the God who works wonders. You revealed your strength among the peoples. With power you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph, Selah. Here he begins to recall the past. God, I call out to you for what reason? God, because you are holy. God, what do you do in your holiness? You redeem your people. You deliver your people. You have done so in the past. You are the God of gods. You are who I am calling to. Why? Because you are the redeemer and the deliverer. And he recalls to mind an occasion where God did such a thing. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you. They trembled. Even the depths shook. The clouds poured down water. The storm clouds thundered. Your arrows flashed back and forth. The sound of your thunder was in the whirlwind. Lightning lit up the world. The earth shook and quaked. Your way went through the sea and your path through the great waters. But your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now here we are all the way back at the parting of the Red Sea and Asaph had just mentioned this very thing back in Psalm 74. So perhaps there is some significance to this story. Maybe he just mentioned it because it's a miraculous story. And indeed it is that God through his power would part a sea, that his people would be able to cross on dry land. Perhaps there is nothing more to the story than that, that God simply is powerful enough to part a Red Sea and he is powerful enough to forgive you and I and to redeem and to deliver us, and so he is. Perhaps there is more to the story than this. Perhaps he brings up this story for other reasons. After all, in this moment, in this time when the Red Sea parted, it's not that this is just a miracle, which it is a great miracle, and we can talk about this miracle and the power of God, but there's more to it than simply God has the power to part a sea. And what does it say here? That 
your footprints were unseen. You parted the sea, you led your people through the sea, but yet there were no footprints there, but yet God was there leading his people through this time. So it is for you and I. Perhaps we don't always see the footprints of God, but God always goes before us. It is God who makes a way for us, who prepares a way for us from our deepest, darkest times to places of freedom. Perhaps that's what he's saying in this story. After all, there really was no nation of Israel on the side of the Red Sea nearest Egypt. God's people had grown. The descendants of Israel had grown. But at that time, Israel were merely a slave to the Egyptians. They were merely a slave people to the Egyptian people. And then, in a moment, in an instant, as they stood at the shores of the Red Sea, and Moses lifted his hands into the air, and the seas parted, and God's people crossed on dry ground, and the enemies of God were swallowed up in the Red Sea. On one side of the Red Sea, God's people were slaves, but on the other side of the Red Sea, God's people were free. On the one side of the Red Sea, they were in trouble. On the other side of the Red Sea, they were at peace. Perhaps that's what Asaph is saying here. Perhaps he is in a time of trouble. Perhaps he knows he needs a miraculous deliverance to go to a place of freedom and to a place of peace. And so it is for you and I. We are slaves of our sin. We are in a place of burden. And we desire to be in a place of peace and a place of rest. And it required no less of a miracle for us to be delivered. The miracle that came for us was not that we part through an ocean, through a sea. But the miracle that came for us was through Jesus Christ. It is Jesus who prepared the way for us. It is Jesus who gives us the ability to come to God to say, God, I cry out to you. I am in a place of trouble, in a place of burden, in a place of sin. And God, I desire to be free. So God has prepared a place for you and I today so that we may go boldly before God through Jesus Christ so that our sins may be forgiven. Perhaps today some in here are struggling with a sin and maybe it is time for us to cry out to the Lord Perhaps it is time for us to cry out to the Lord all night long and recall the power of God in the past and the greatest power that He gave was through Jesus Christ. May we be delivered through that power tonight, through the power of Jesus' death and resurrection. May we be taken from those who are slaves of sin to those who are free in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, we come to You. We thank You for this fantastic chapter, dear Lord. What a... What a great passage for us to consider, God. Maybe there are some in here tonight and they needed this passage right here and right now. God, maybe there are some in here tonight and they'll need it years down the road. I pray that you'd help us to tuck it away, dear Lord, that at whatever time we need whatever of your word we read, that we will find it. God, I pray that you would help us in our troubles whatever our troubles may be, whatever our struggles may be, and whatever our sins may be. God, I pray that you give us peace, that you help us to humble ourselves before you, that we seek you, dear Lord, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Because, God, when we seek you, we will find you. Just as Asaph did, just as so many before us in the pages of Scripture did, God, we will find you. So I pray, God, that tonight, that if there is one here that does not know Jesus Christ, that they would, that they would seek you, dear Lord, and they would find you through him. God, maybe there are some here today, and they are already yours, but maybe they feel like Asaph. Maybe life has led them to a place, through whatever means that has occurred, that they do not feel your presence, that they do not feel you hear them, that they do not feel you are with them. God, I pray that they would know that your miraculous power is still active today. God, you may not always be happy with us. You may, in fact, be angry with us sometimes, for we sin. 
But God, I pray that we would repent of our sins, that we would humble ourselves before you. And God, that you would show us your grace, that we'd feel your presence and have our joy restored. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.